Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to come to speak to you. Um, I would have to say that I think that to have the patient on first shows remarkable perspicacity in this situation. This is really good. Usually the patient's the last slot in the afternoon. Somebody remembers all this health chat is about patients, and they get a slot at about 4.30 when everybody's just trickling off with the train. So well done to um, the Academy. Um, I am here as a patient, but I also sit on the Committee for the Safety of Devices for the MHRA. I also sit on their Novel Technology Selection Panel. Now, I think I got there, I'm there as a layperson, not because I know anything much about novel technology, but I think I got there because I was extremely rude about the fact that I didn't think they were doing enough about novel technology. So I think that's how I arrived there. I did chair the expert group on the uh, metal debris from metal-on-metal -metal hip replacements for the MHRA. So that's my background. So perhaps as a patient, I know rather more about um, health technology than the average person. We are all patients. Um, some of us are carers, but we all need health care at some time, and mostly towards the end of our lives. We're all dependent on health technology to a greater or lesser extent. Maybe it's to manage a chronic condition, diabetes, monitoring our glucose level, or even just to tell us we're well with a diagnostic kit. The College of Medicine is a new college, and it is about service and science and healing. It puts patients in the center with clinicians and scientists working together for a broader, rather more caring and patient-focused approach to healthcare. It's extremely exciting. It's got some very eminent people who are involved with it. And if you look at our website, which is down there, collegeofmedicine.org.uk, you can look up and see what we're about. We have some innovative sites on our website where we are using new ways of delivering health care that are actually happening in the UK. Science is continuously transforming how health care is delivered and we need to rethink the approaches and delivery and we do need engineers for this. I just want to remind you that devices, which is really everything that isn't a drug that we use in health care, um, go back a long way. This is the bath chairs running from uh, the bathhouse in Bath to take the people who have dreadful gout down to the waters for a curative um, uh, thing. Here we go. This is the deluxe model. And this is the high speed model. I think that when you... Uh, posed the question to a member of the public, somebody in the street, and you said to him, how does engineering fit into healthcare? He might say, oh, well, that's the scanner, or he might say it's a hip replacement. And interesting, the hip replacement is the second most successful um, operation that's carried out. Glaucoma and the cataract, not glaucoma, the cataract's first, but the hip replacement is the most, uh, second most successful in terms of life-changing uh, operation. And I don't think that a lot of health professionals would actually be terribly well informed about all this technology that happens around them. It's sort of subliminal. They're using it every day. They start in their training. They put in a thermometer. They take your blood pressure. But they aren't thinking, I'm using a device. I'm using something that's been engineered and put together. And I do think that more recently, with the Afghanistan and the soldiers coming back, we suddenly see guys who are um, using prosthetic uh, limbs and engineering and beginning to be a little bit more aware of how it fits in with healthcare. So, devices. Well, there are 90,000 of them to choose from. And they are examples. It's anything that isn't a drug that's used in diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, treatment of disease or disability. Diagnosis and treatment for compensation for injury or handicapped. It's most of that needs engineering when you get down to it. So if you take hospitals, um, we have the more obvious things like pacemakers, hips, but even the beds are something that need engineering. 
My first meeting at the MHRA, we spent discussing how beds kill people. I was appalled. I thought people just got in them. But not a bit of it. You know, if they're hydraulic, they collapse. If they're demented, they get wound up in the bars. I mean, it was really quite a revelation. And then you have um, the, uh, in primary care, you've got people who are using monitors for their diabetes, for blood pressure, ECGs, and so on. And then in the home setting, we've got wheelchairs, hoists, lifts, and all these things that people need to actually manage their lives. I think that we, the 15 billion pounds is a pretty amazing figure. That's bigger than the drug bill. So that makes the spend bigger. The only spend that's bigger in the NHS is the staff bill. So it's a very, very big market. And this 15 billion doesn't include social care, and it doesn't include what's going on in the private sector and the home. And we also, of course, have to maintain the devices. So there's a big cost there. Um, I just bring this to your attention <laughs> because when you have bits of mechanic things and they go wrong, there's always an issue about uh, litigation and the risks that are involved. Um, clearly, the NHS is pretty anxious that uh, we don't have any more litigation than we have. Uh, and that they're looking for, if I say a risk-free life, it doesn't work like that. Um, but it, there are, these are big sums. But equally, for people who are um, running trusts, they need to have maintenance of engineering things put into their budgets. You can't run these, these great big bits of equipment without proper maintenance. So hopes and expectations. We just talk about the government. We absolutely know that the current model of care is unsustainable. Um, Derek, oh, I can't think what his name is. Um, yes, Wandless, sorry, I knew it began with W. Um, calculated that we'd be out of funds by 2020. So we need to think about delivering care in a different way. So as far as the government's concerned, it's got to be quicker, slicker, and cheaper health care. We need better public health. We need much more prevention. We need more self-care, self-management, and more patient empowerment, and cost-effective screening. I think that uh, the... Uh, Patient empowerment is a really key bit of uh, healthcare going forward. And we, we see patients being empowered by the internet. We see them being able to go and look and ask more questions and get more involved. But it is also about the patients taking greater care of themselves so they don't end up needing the services of the NHS. And this whole model completely reflects the new College of Medicine's uh, philosophy. Health professionals, well, they want better outcomes for their patients. They want less risk for the patients. They also want less risk for the clinicians because they're the ones who get sued. And the highest rate, I think, is with obstetricians and gynecologists. They want less of the sort of Me Too type um, devices. I think they want improved devices, but not the same as the one that we had before. We need better quality, better reliability, and better availability, and better instructions for use. This has been, a, I know, a discussion that we've had in the MHRA, um, and it applies to people who are using the uh, devices, but it also applies to the patients when they're self-using them. And the screening is clearly an issue for both the government, for the health professionals, and indeed for the patients. So what does the patient want? Actually, the patient wants to stay at home. They don't really want to get into this health system if they can possibly avoid it. They want a good quality of life. They want to keep out of secondary care. So they're looking for devices that help them to do that. They need to be safe. 
They need to be reliable, they need to be robust, effective, reusable, with easy to understand instructions. Now, I don't think it's quite difficult for the manufacturer to imagine what might happen to his device when it's in the home setting. But boy, you know, we'll just pop it on the cooker and suddenly it's a bit melted or I leave it on top of the toaster or something. I, you just really, really need to understand that when it says re robust, that's what it needs to be when it's gone into the home setting. Then we have new materials and new technologies. Um, the day surgery uh, uh, in Edinburgh, where I come from, in the new hospital there, we have a suite for the day surgery, which is 24 operating theatres in a mile of corridors. It's a pretty impressive unit, and I experienced it the other day, and I thought it was very efficient, and it was a great credit to the NHS. Then I sat in my bed when I'm in my semi-recovery situation wondering how many devices we've used during the course of the day. And I actually think we were knocking up about 100 by the time you thought about absolutely every aspect of you know, the bed, the trolley, the thing, the pump, you know, everything. It was, it was amazing. More keyhole surgery has to be better for patients and uh, better for bed turn and cost savings for the government. The bio-robotic surgery with imaging... Um, Jeff has already touched on that. The robotic surgery is coming. The robots need to be smaller. They will get smaller, just like your telephones were enormous to start with, and now they're so small you can barely find them. And the robots will get like that too. Most systems need software. And we have to recognize that the software goes with the uh, new technology. And we need new ways of testing products. It's very difficult when you've got something that's really innovative to find out how you're going to test it except on the front line. And I thought Jeff alluded to the notion of spending the money in order to get the evidence. Everybody wants to use something that's evidence-based, but it's very difficult when it's one item and it's only in one center to get that sort of evidence pulled together. And we need to think of new ways of applying systems. It's um, quite interesting that uh, there are, you know, when you have, if I say good manufacturing process, but systems for uh, new technology, you have to ensure that the system you have in place doesn't prohibit the blue sky thinking, the thinking out of the box. Because it seems to me the risk-adverse bit of industry finds it quite tricky to get into the blue sky bit. And that's really why we end up with the small spin-offs out of university or the SMEs producing the blue sky bit. And when they're a bit more sure about it, they're prepared to pick it up, the big boys, and run with it. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize the NHS is not up to it, Mark, with its own IT system. I have no idea how this is ever, ever going to be resolved. Because it seems to me the biggest holdup inside the NHS is the lack of IT um, communication. And what, it, what we have to do is say it is how it is. We can't solve it. I don't think the government can solve it. Whether they get it solved, I don't know, but it's going to take quite a long time to solve. So whatever it is we do, we need to work around that. We have a new generation that are techno-savvy, not me, but other people, who have this amazing mobile phone technology with apps. We can have apps for your care. We could have an app, you know. The college is developing an app for self-care at the moment. And... The whole notion of being able to plug in, check, find out what we're doing, take a reading, get a reading from somewhere else, whatever it is, is all there in this new generation. And I do think that uh, the social network is a way of communicating information and spreading information, providing it's correct. Um, and we have, to, we have to use it in order to maximize empowering people and making 
uh, people take greater care of themselves. Now, there are half a million products in Europe, and we have 22,000 technical businesses, and 80% of them are SMEs. So we're good at innovation in the engineering business. But there is a lack of consistency about testing uh, for new products, uh, and we need greater uniformity across Europe for the testing that goes on. And one hopes that the recast of the European Directive will help with this. We know that the CE kite mark is not working as it should work. And it's quite shocking that class one surgical instruments can be marketed in the EU without any control at all. The work of Bart's and the London Hospital has shown that the error rate is 15 out of every 100 for instruments, where only one instrument is ordered and it's faulty. This can create a problem. And not many trusts are able to put the sort of money and resource that Bart's have put into checking the instruments as they come in for use. There is a huge cost implication. There's uh, a cost implication because of the actual failures of the instruments. There's a cost implication for the patient who's damaged by a faulty instrument. And there's a cost implication because you get litigated against subsequently. I am aware, and I raised it last week at the Committee for Safety of Devices meeting, that we don't have a, life, a shelf life on stuff that comes in for use, the technical stuff that comes in for use. Um, and I do think that perhaps there's something needs to be written into uh, the recast for that as well. So, we have this amazing, huge global business, and today in the, I don't know, it was the Times, I think, there was an article about the NHS being able to sell itself to the rest of the world much more efficiently and actually make money out of it. And this technical side is the side we could be doing that we could be doing much more of it. The public wants innovation, it wants to stay well, and it wants to stay in its home. And I think that that's a pretty good reason for uh, working on new innovation. We know that there are huge opportunities. Everybody's living longer, they're getting fatter, they've got long-term chronic disease, but we need to think about the risks, and we need to think about standards. Risk is seen differently by different groups, and we as a society are incredibly risk adverse. I mean, I'm a pharmacist, and believe you me, we don't go around taking risks, you know. If somebody says you want 30 tablets, we don't give you 29 or 31, we give you 30. And we try and give you the right one, because we know the risk is absolutely enormous if we don't dispense the right one. We have regulation which is there to help us with this risk. And it is a brave new world out there, and it's very difficult for the regulator to get the balance right between not killing the innovation with the over-requirement for the risk-averse evidence and getting the innovation in place. We need standards, but we'd like to think that manufacturers are working to standards that were greater than the ones that are laid down. We'd like to think that all the CE kite marks are genuine and not counterfeit. I think people assume that if it's got a kite mark on, it's fit for use and it's okay, and we would like it to be like that. For patients buying directly from the internet, clearly the risk goes up, because they don't really know where it's come from or how, how it was sourced. So we have a lot of challenges there, and we need to think about them. We, I'll get to the next one. I don't think that most people think that engineers have got anything to do with health service. I really don't. I mean, I'm quite sure you in the room would agree me, with me with that. I mean, those of you who are specialists, who are in special disciplines, will be using any amount of beautifully engineered um, equipment on a daily basis. But I don't think most people think that engineers have got anything to do with the health service. I would like to suggest that perhaps the College of Medicine needs to go patients, clinicians, scientists and engineers as well. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks very much, Christine. Right, any um, comments or questions to, uh, to Christine now? Uh, there's one thing, uh, one thing I would like to um, say. I mean, you, I think you reminded us there very much of the sort of the centrality of uh, engineering in medicine. I mean, it, it is, I think, and you're quite right when you say that people simply don't think about engineering as actually part of medicine, and yet it's quite staggering, the, uh, the, the impact that it has in its many different forms. It, it seems to me there's one advantage that this relative neglect has, that unlike the drug industry, um, the engineering input in, into medicine is not subject to the sort of violent emotional spasms of, of, of the public. Um, people don't uh, feel they want to uh, campaign in the streets against GE healthcare in the way they might do against Pfizer or, 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 or GSK. So it does have that advantage. People are, are not, don't get so exercised about it in, in a negative sense. No, I think that's right. And it's partly, I think, because, um, I mean, the drug industry is subject to much greater requirements to get the product into market. And then they have the business about, you know, the trials and whether all the evidence has been produced. You don't have to go through quite that same level of evidence in order to get the product into market. And I do think that, I mean, it's pretty difficult to get exercised about, I don't know, a hospital bed or something. I mean, actually, you know, a bed's what you need. You need a bed that works. You need a bed that's not going to kill you. You just want it properly engineered, don't you? I, I, I think that it's a less contentious thing. You're absolutely right. But, you know, when you get into the drug industry, you've got all the other things that go on, you know, are we shelling this out in Africa? Are we making a fortune on the back of people's ill health and so on and so forth? I think people see something that they're going to use as a much more reasonable... It's not being exploited. Yes. It doesn't have the expectation. You're absolutely right. But it's really what it's... I mean, after all, I mean, um, commerce is at the heart of engineering. Every time someone sells a scanner or a thermometer or a hospital bed, they're making a profit. Um, then you say that people are making profits out of drugs and some of how people feel it's kind of immoral. It's very odd, that d yeah. division, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. But I think also the, the money that's needed to bring a, a, a pharmaceutical product to market is absolutely huge. Right. The actual yeah. sums of money are huge. A couple of questions there. Yes, uh, can you wait till the microphone gets you and also say who you are before you put the question in? Lionel Tarasenko, University of Oxford. Um, one of the things that we do is courses for six formers in the Head Start program when we try and tell them about engineering. And I have to say that the picture about engineers being involved in medicine has changed a lot in the last decade. So I give the talk about engineers in medicine to the sixth formers. Ten years ago, I had to have a reserve slide because I always start by asking him to name applications of engineering and medicine. So I have a reserve slide with prosthetic devices, medical imaging, and pacemakers, I think, are the three. Last year, when I gave the course, I had to stop after 20 that came back from the audience. So I think they're doing something right in schools well in the sixth form for those who are studying physics. They're much more aware possibly Good. because of the Paralympics, possibly because of the spread of medical imaging. But I think young people coming out of sixth form, reading physics and so on, are much more aware of the impact of engineering and physics on medicine than they were 10 years ago. And I think that's obviously a trend that uh, is to be welcomed. Good. Yeah, it's encouraging. Isn't it? And another question there. Yes, again, if you can see who you are first. Thanks. My name is Chris Ramsden. I'm uh, president of the Chartered Society of Designers, uh, but I'm also a consultant clinical scientist, bioengineer. Some key words, you, I, I enjoyed your presentation, but some key words that weren't mentioned was the word design, because you can, you can and a lot of standards is, and regulations are about being able to produce the same thing, which can be quite badly designed, reliably in large numbers. A big source of error, uh, problems in healthcare, a user error. We're having lots of deaths and injuries because the basic ergonomics, human factors design of a lot of products is woefully sad and would not be tolerated in any other industry. Um, and I think also there is a, a very big misunderstanding, as you highlighted, between uh, for a lot of the regulators in fully understanding and, and, and the public the, the real difficulty in getting new medical devices through to the market. It is in some cases very close to a pharmaceutical issues. Beds are one thing, they're a different class. You try and rush a pacemaker through, change a hip joint, an implant, artificial heart valve, there is a, a, a deep lack of understanding within some of the regulators, such as MHRA, etc., as to how you go about evaluating devices. It's very difficult to do a, an RCT study on a hip. 
or a pacemaker, and yet it is often still seen because it's very pharmaceutical driven that an RCT is a gold standard. We need, it, it is changing, and lots of people are helping that, but we, we do need en engineering and design are vital elements now in modern healthcare delivery. I feel, I feel suitably admonished for not having said anything about design. I would like to say to you that the um, MHRA, as I sit there as a lay person at the MHRA, and Dr. Ludgate's here, and I'm sure she will um, say, uh, or add to what I say, are really keen to be involved at an early stage to see that we work together to see what it is we need to do to get it to market. And certainly in the innovations um, selection panel that, we, uh, that I sit on, we're very keen not to stifle the innovation because of being too prescriptive about the reg regulatory framework. And I do, as a lay person, I mean, I've said it to Dr. Ludgate, she said it can't be done because of the EU directive and everything else. But I mean, my view is that if you have something that's really innovative, then it should be let out with a different sort of um, uh, I don't know the word is quite uh, arrangement. You know, you look at every three uses of the the product, come back and report, and then as it begins to settle down, you might say, okay, every ten, please report back and tell us what's happening to the patient. Is it working? And so on, so that you allow the innovation out sooner but you have a higher reporting back. I mean, we've got, you know, post-market surveillance is the th really what we're talking about here. And, you know, with HIPS, they're in place for 30 years. And the, what is it, ASR one? Was tested, I mean, to oblivion in the laboratory, but it didn't show up until it got into the body and was then discovered that it was not really fit for purpose and had to be withdrawn. Um, I think the post-market surveillance People don't think about post-market surveillance with devices. They think about it with drugs. But the average health professional, I don't think, thinks, my God, I need to report this to the MHRA, unless it's something really astonishing. They'll just go, give me another one. You know, <laughs> it's not fit for that. Send me, you know, get, get, get me another one up, or whatever. So I do think that registers for big bits of kit are really helpful. But registers are very expensive to run. We, we, we at the MHRA know that they work. You know, the National Joint Register has been a success. But we would like to have other registers for other innovative technology. But they cost money and uh, they need to be funded. But we then get the evidence and it becomes much more meaningful. Uh, one more question. Yes, gentlemen there. Hi, Gotham McGraw there. I'm a surgeon. Um, I, I think the RCTs are really not useful for devices or surgery. In fact, I take uh, issue with uh, Professor Neal's suggestion of getting 12 robotic devices and comparing the outcome with standard operations because it's, there's a learning curve for all surgical procedures. And basically, engineers don't use RCTs. You would not fly in an aeroplane that's part of a randomized controlled trial. <laughs> well so said. There, there are other ways of actually moving knowledge forward. And I think medicine has got too hooked on this Absolutely. pharmaceutical technique. And we need to, it, there's actually a great need to develop other ways of developing devices and, and, and surgical interventions and things. Any comment on that? Or? I'm absolutely with you. I mean, I, I, I think even in the world of drugs, the RCTs are far too um, much the gold standard. Uh, and I'm, I'm in the business of looking out of the box. What we want is patients to feel better and to evaluate the risk of, you know, I'm taking a risk by using this or taking this, and is it worth that risk? And, you know, Robert Winston said that the best discoveries are often shocking and fly in the face of conventional knowledge. Well, as long as we're hooked up to the RCT, we're not going to have any blue sky thinking, are we? As Dr. Ludgate like to say something, I knew she would. <laughs> Can I just say as, as regulator that um, we have never promoted RCTs for devices. I think it's an almost impossible situation. The FDA uh, go in for this and they... They think up all sorts of imaginary predicate devices, which I think is totally false. I have never promoted an RCT for a device. I think 
It's almost impossible. As you say, you've got a learning curve. You've got to work out with your device where it's useful, its criteria for use, its place on the market. Then you can start looking at maybe, you know, with the new heart valves, transcatheter heart valves, you had to work these up, use them, see how useful they were, and then you can compare them with surgery. But you can't do RCTs from day one. Impossible. So can I just say that? Thank you. Well, that may come up again later on, but uh, now we've... Uh...